Okay, we're going to start in chapter 12, uh, War Within. And we're going to start reading Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 in the NIV. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. If I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Okay, so Paul's describing here a struggle. He's a Christian, a struggle that all Christians go through. And uh, he describes the war within here. It's actually not a war with our body. Some people confuse that and think that their body is the enemy. Other people believe it's uh, a war with their soul, thinking their soul is, is the problem. But in reality, he's talking about a sinful nature. That's why I like that version. It actually points it right out that it's a sinful nature. But some are confused about that, and we'd like to clear that up a little bit, because one thing they believe is that the sinful nature here, when we're born again, some people believe that it is eradicated, or it's completely transformed, uh, regenerated, as one term would be, and that we no longer have a sin nature. And uh, they use some Bible verses somewhat out of context and the timing of things to support those ideas, like... Um, or a new creation in Christ, which is true, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Or they use philosophy that light can't dwell with darkness. So therefore, where God goes, he just lights the place up and all the darkness leaves. But uh, that's uh, both incorrect. And it's sort of like us saying that when Satan came to earth, or I mean, when Jesus came to earth, Satan left. And, uh, you know, the problem was then the Romans and the Pharisees. But in reality, there was a conflict there, and Satan didn't leave. <coughs> and uh, so we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, this particular verse that points us out to start with in Romans 7, 18. And in the King James, I'll read that version there. That says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So the flesh here is not referring to the body. Some people might think that. But in reality, the flesh here is referring to uh, the human nature. It's, uh, it's uh, no good thing dwells within it. Now we know that if we have the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is good. He dwells within the body of the believer. So that couldn't be referring to the body, referring to, in my flesh, no good thing. So that's referring to this fallen human nature, the old nature. And in Romans uh, 7, 18, same verse in the NIV, it says that very clearly there. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. No good within me is this right here. The Bible we went into uh, during class of the fall, how this became uh, desperately wicked. It's the heart that's dark, basically. It's uh, full of deception and every evil work. It's the problem. It's our enemy. That uh, it doesn't go away when we're born again. When it died, it didn't go away. It actually just became corrupted. And it's spreading its corruption now throughout the world. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a Christian must do is to distinguish the sources of our motivations, of our thoughts, the thoughts in our head, where they come from the motivations around us. And we can see uh, the Bible supports that in Hebrews 5, 13 through 14. It's a process of uh, growth that we learn to discern. So let's go ahead and uh, read that. For everyone that, it, that, uses, that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's the good and evil that we got to discern 
And uh, that is, first of all, right here, the good nature, the bad nature. They have many voices. They have many, many names. And uh, for example, uh, one name of the old nature would be, or a voice of the old nature, you might say, would be somebody that condemns you all the time. It's always condemning the soul, saying you're no good. You'll never be any good. You're a failure. You're a loser. But that's all it does is just condemn you. That would be considered the accuser, the old nature. That's, that's the kind of thing that it would be saying to our soul, to the person you are. But on the other hand, the new nature might be saying along those lines about you need to change something, and this is what you need to do instead. And it'll give you direction, and it'll tell you to repent from sin, to change from doing wrong to do right. And it'll encourage you to do right. That would be the counselor, the new nature. So they both have voices, influence on the soul, and they both are different. And we're going to look at some of those differences uh, in this chapter. And we're going to look at some of the lists there in the chapter on page uh, 200 and 201. It's a list of the different voices, or different uh, names of these voices, or different names of these natures. So let's go ahead and, uh, would you read that list? Uh, we'll go ahead and I'll point uh, the new nature, old nature, with their different names there. First of all, the first one on the list here is what, the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, the human spirit, identity of Christ, identity of self, divine nature, fallen nature, holy, pure, good, carnal, worldly, sinful, new man, old man, fresh water, salt water, flowing well of living water, bitter fountain, new heart, wicked heart, good tree, corrupt tree, source of good fruit, source of evil fruit, Comforter, judgmental, counselor, accuser, reconciler, condemner, source of love and respect, source of lust and pride, servant of Christ, servant of Satan, light illuminating, darkness blinding, full of truth, deceiver, child of God, child of the devil, source of empowering faith, source of diligence. Debilitating. Debilitating fear, sorry. Mm -hmm. Source of debilitating fear. And uh, that's what fear does. It debilitates us, freezes us sometimes from what is good. You're afraid to witness, afraid of rejection or failure. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, the Bible often uses some of these ideas of symbolic languages to help us uh, visualize uh, these two entities within us, the new nature, old nature. And we'll look at some of those things in John 7, 38 through 39, uh, referring to the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that. Would you like to read that? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, here plainly says the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, was symbolized by living water. Um, that's, a, that's what it's referring to there very plainly. In John 4:14, 4, here's another reference. But whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, so that's uh, the Holy Spirit coming within the well of living water, and he satisfies our core desires. He's refreshing. Uh, there's a conflict, though, and we'll look at that conflict a little bit. In James 3, 9 through 12. Let's go ahead and read that, James 3, 9 through 12. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine fig? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Okay, so it's referring here to the two fountains here. 
fountains of water, salt water here, fresh water here, Holy Spirit, the old nature. And they're coming through our mouth. It's talking about our words. A lot of times our words can help us to realize which nature we're plugging into. It's sort of, uh, it could be either one. Sometimes it's a back and forth between them. But our, our soul can actually filter the nature. It can flavor in a sense. It can suppress the nature. But in reality, uh, it, it is influenced quite often by the nature that's motivating and inspiring the words. It has a voice of its own, as we've seen in uh, the first verse we read in Romans, that the soul has a voice, the person you are. This soul is the person you are. This is the species we are. The old nature is our old human species. And uh, the Holy Spirit is God. He is the new nature that comes to dwell within the Christian, making us a new creation. It's a process that takes place. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. Uh, also, the Holy Spirit can speak to the unsaved person. Before he comes in, he speaks to the unsaved soul to ask, can I come in? He sometimes speaks many things to the unsaved person. It's sort of like uh, you've seen the old uh, idea of the two people, the one on each shoulder, the good guy, the bad guy, and they're all speaking to the person, and he's got to make a choice. Who is he going to listen to? So in reality, the Holy Spirit has a voice, and he speaks to everybody, but especially to the Christians, because he's right within us, and we're... Uh, in union with him. Let's go ahead and read Luke uh, 12, 12. Do you have that? Or maybe I'll read that. I'm not sure if you got that in the book there. It says, For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. So right there is talking about the Holy Spirit teaching in that same hour what to say. He has an ability to teach, to, review, to have a voice to speak to us, the souls, uh, the persons uh, here on earth. And... Uh, direct us but uh, the new nature has a voice but so does the old nature and we see that in uh, a parable that was re uh, that was recorded uh, Jesus spoke about Luke 12 19 through 21 I'll go ahead and read that <clears throat> it says and I'll say to my soul now the I here is the old nature I will say to my soul so the old nature here is now speaking to the soul Jesus is recording this. He said, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that is, so he that, so is he that layeth up treasures for himself, but is not rich towards God. He has a voice, but it's not one that lays up treasures for God. It's always a selfish ambitions kind of situation. And they're both are referred to as trees also besides rivers. And uh, Luke 6, 43 through 45 refers to uh, this, how the trees bear fruit. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor a bramble bush gather thy grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that is which evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Okay, so that's what we're referring to here. It's also referred to as a heart, uh, the good heart, the bad heart, coming through our, can be emotionally, but the inspiration is rooted in the old nature, the new nature, and the fruit that it produces is either good or bad, coming through our words, coming through our actions. Let's go ahead and also read uh, Matthew seven sixteen through 20. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay, so it's referring to the fruits of these two natures here. 
And it says that a good tree can't bear bad fruit. It's always going to be good fruit. From, the, from God, the new nature always comes good fruit. The bad nature, the old nature, always bears bad fruit in God's eyes. It may look good to us sometimes, but it's poison. Eventually it leads to death. So uh, the thing is that all of us have, as Christians, both these natures. So it's not good to follow somebody blindly, but always test the spirits. Because it could be a combination of one and then the other coming from any person. So we don't want to just listen to a person all the time and think that they're always right, because that's not the case ever. We all have flaws. We all have this old nature. Only Christ was only, always right. And uh, so he speaks through many people. And he also has used, you know, situations. You know, he's, he can use a donkey if he wants to, to speak through. The uh, thing is, what we need to do is look for the meat, what God's saying, and then spit out the bones, in a sense. There's no saying about that. It's about chew the meat, digest the meat, and then spit out the bones. In a sense, uh, the Bible illustrates that with uh, sheep when they graze and they digest things and then later they regurgitate and it's sort of like the how chewing cud but sheep do similar things or they actually then spit out the rocks you know the things that aren't digestible things that aren't true for their good uh, health and so that's the idea is uh, we're always to be fruit inspectors look for god in every situation it's not good to look for god in a fortune teller or fool because he's generally not found there uh, he's, uh, that would be a foolish idea to go to a fortune teller to ask him of your future because that's like asking the devil what's his future for you. And so we don't want to do that kind of thing, but always look for God and God's people and also what God's using at the time for us. He can use a child. He can use an animal. He can use all kinds of things. I've seen him use the radio on occasions. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at Matthew 12, 33 through 35 either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit O generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. That's what we're referring to that. Look for wisdom with those that are walking with God, a lot more than from a fool or a fortune teller. But it also says make the tree good or make the tree evil. It's talking to your soul here. He's not talking about these trees being changed, but he's talking about the connection to them changing. If we're actually feeding off the fruit of this tree, He's saying to change the tree and make the tree a good tree instead, the Holy Spirit. And that's how that's uh, applied there. Because these trees don't change their fruit, as the Bible is very clear about. But a clue to what tree we're connected to is what's coming out of our mouth, what's coming out of our life. And so uh, we can suppress it, but uh, it'll eventually show forth what kind of fruit it actually uh, will produce, will identify what kind of tree or source it's coming from. Let's go ahead and uh, read the fruit of these two different trees. Uh, in Galatians 19 through 23, list the fruit. But let's just look at the old nature first. Uh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. First thing is, this is the works of the flesh. It's not the works of the body here, because the body doesn't envy. The works of the old nature is what's referring to as flesh, and it does envy. Um, it's listed here as a lot of the different works that fruits that are bared by, uh, produced by this old nature. In reality, uh, that's what contaminated the world since the Garden of Eden. It will not contaminate heaven. It's not allowed to go to heaven. That doesn't mean that the soul practicing these things will be eliminated from heaven necessarily. 
if you receive a new nature, then you have a new identity, and he is the key to heaven. But this will be removed at heaven's door, basically, and not allowed to bear fruit in heaven. So these things will not be found in heaven, that list there. And uh, we can see an addition to that list in Matthew 15, 18 through 19. It says, But those things which proceed us out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and the heart, and from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. So it's referring to the heart here that defiles the man. It's the heart that comes out of the mouth. It's not what we eat, but what comes out of our mouth. Not what we take in so much as what comes out of us that represents our problem, the defilement of the nature that God has to eliminate from heaven because it produces this fruit on a continuing basis. Now we have an option, and that option is uh, the new nature. And we'll go ahead and read the, the new nature's fruit here in Galatians 5, and 23. These are the fruit that will be in heaven, and everybody in heaven will produce these fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temper temperance against such there is no law okay so that's the fruit of the new nature and uh, every soul any soul can actually be good for a while but that's in spite of our old nature that's why being good is usually temporal it's usually temporary before this at some point will take over and you'll have a bad day and create a bad day for other people so that's the reason why it has to be dealt with people an unsaved person can be a good soul suppressing this, but it's temporary. Even us, we'll have days, we'll have this in full control and have a bad day. And uh, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at uh, Luke eleven twenty three. 23. He, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Okay, so God sees this as black and white. It's either this or this. It's either with him or against him. There's no real middle ground here with God. He sees things clearly for the root that produces all those different fruits that sometimes it's hard for us to distinguish the, the exact cause for the effects. God sees that he's a, either it's with him or against him. And in 1 John 4, 1, he tells us to be, be aware and to test these things because uh, some things will come in sheep's a wolf in sheep's clothing, in a sense. But, uh, and it's not true, it's from the old nature. But in reality, it can be distinguished if we use the Word of God to check it out. Go ahead and uh, read 1 John 1, 9, or 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Actually, this is very common in our world. Everywhere you'll find this problem, and uh, the Bible acknowledges that. And we all deal with this, no matter who we are, how strong or biblical we may think we are, we still have to deal with this. In James uh, 1.13, uh, let's go ahead and uh, look at that verse. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God is not the one that's tempting us here. It's our own nature, or Satan, different things. But it's never God tempting us to do evil. Uh, the word uh, man here says, let no man say. And uh, that's a masculine term. We go into that in uh, earlier chapters about masculine and feminine terms and identities. And uh, it covers mankind because it's the identity of all of man. So he's not excluding women here. He's uh, saying uh, all mankind are tempted. So uh, every man is tempted when he uh, is drawn away of his own lust. And in, when, uh, did we read uh, James? Let's go ahead and read James 1, 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own house and enticed. Then when the lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, so that's a progression. And this is a problem that we all deal with. And uh, it comes from, we're drawn to sin because of our old nature. 
That's why in heaven, this will have to be removed. For me to sin in heaven, I still have free choices to make, but they won't be tempted with sin any longer. It'd be like trying to tempt me to eat cockroaches. That's just de despicable. And the thing is that when this is removed, all sin will be despicable. Anything less than perfection will be despicable. And the old nature will be completely removed, which promotes this sort of less than perfect situations for society and the corruption that it spreads. It's like a magnet. It draws these things to, to it. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, it's contaminated our world. And uh, it's actually, this is actually masculine in the sense that uh, it gives identity, the identity of man here, the identity of children of God here. The soul is the person we are. It's a feminine term. It bears the fruit of one of these two identities. And that fruit will come through your soul and affect our life. And we can see that a little bit here in uh, James 4.4 4 in the Amplified Version. Let's just read verse 4 in that. Do um, you have that there? You are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. It's referring to, once again, you're either for me or against me here. And uh, you see that it's sort of like a marriage relationship that takes place here when we're born again. The Holy Spirit comes in because the old husband has died. So we're free from that if we recognize that. He produces nothing but death and corruption. So we're set free from that by the new man. And the new man comes in and creates a new relationship with us, a new union with us that makes us part of a new family. In a sense, this is our new identity. This is like the man producing a new fruit through the wife, in a sense. We're the wife of the Holy Spirit in a symbolic sense, the wife of the Spirit of Christ. And so uh, that's what it's referring to here. And when we are unfaithful here, it's like adultery in God's eyes. We're producing bad fruit from somebody that we shouldn't be producing fruit from at all. So it's a spiritual adultery. We see uh, if we're in a, we all fall into problems because we're not faithful, because we're not really pure many times. But our goal is to strive to be more pure, more consistent. And we see if we do fall into these things, James, a little further down that list, James 4, 8, in the Amplified Version says, uh, go ahead and read that. Come close to God, and He will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal, wavering individuals with divided interests, and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. That's what He encourages us to do. He's, he'll forgive us and uh, restore us. And... Uh, but to recognize we all deal with this, so 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let's go ahead and uh, look at that, because we have to resist the flirting with the old nature and its thought patterns in order to be faithful to the new nature. Let's go ahead and uh, look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Temptation sometimes is obvious uh, how to escape it. But this is a tough one. How do we escape ourself? You know, that's what Paul says, I need to crucify myself. How do I die to myself? The self here is this right here, old nature. It's not the personality of the person he's trying to crucify. He's not saying to cease becoming a good personality or any kind of particular personality, but he's saying, the self of selfishness, the self-centeredness, the old nature, the identity of man. Um, that's what he needs to uh, deal with. And that's what we need to figure out. How do we deal with that, escape that from bearing fruit from us? And he uses a words about crucifying. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look uh, at Romans uh, 7, 4 before we get into that. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. OK, 
Okay, so that's what it's talking about. And we have the ability uh, to be married to another in a sense in order to bear the fruit of God. Uh, the fruit that was listed there, love, joy, peace, and long-suffering and things. But in order to do that, we need to deal with this old nature, with our old self. And we need to figure out how can we actually crucify self without annihilating our personality or something. And just distinguish it between the old nature, the old species, and the person you are. God doesn't want us to deny the person you are, but instead the fallen species that you were born in. We'll look at uh, three nails that can uh, be applied to do this. And the first nail is dedicating our body to Jesus, to God. And uh, clean the house up around us, our physical environment. If there's things that are leading us down, bringing us down, or satanic, or, or ungodly, remove all those things from our presence, in a sense, physically dedicate our body to Jesus Christ. That would be the first nail out of the three nails it takes to crucify self. Let's go ahead and read Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, that brings us to the second nail, dedicating our body, and the second nail would be uh, our mind. Basically purifying our mind. Washing our mind in the water of the word in a sense. Uh, let's look at Philippians 2, 3 through 7. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of God of men. Here's a reference to avoid being self-centered, basically. Uh, look at uh, other things, how you can help other people. Uh, walk in humility would be a good uh, uh, paraphrase of that passage there. Humility of mind, not seeing ourselves as better than others, but helping others by the power of God. If uh, he calls you to do something, to be able to do that with an attitude of love instead of an attitude of arrogance. So let's go ahead and take a look at Philippians, 3, or Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which hath this all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, so that thankfulness is really what helps us to have peace of mind. As uh, looking at the things that we can be thankful for, in a sense, counting your blessings. God has blessed all of us. And we have things to be thankful for, but we often overlook if we don't actually look for them. So one thing we can fill our mind with is positive, good, thankful things that uh, God is doing for us or has done in the past for us and being grateful for those things. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He doesn't want us to be in fear, but because fear will attract the very thing you're afraid of. We went into in previous classes. But having a sound mind, sometimes that can be a fear in itself, thinking, because uh, I remember uh, thinking of, I was seeing symptoms of Alzheimer's, my mother's had Alzheimer's and stuff, and that is a, a tragic situation that I wouldn't want to be in. But uh, so God had actually directed me how to avoid that thing, that kind of thing. And uh, he's uh, helped me uh, and restored my mind and gave me peace in those areas. So he gives us a sound mind. So that's something we can claim that uh, we don't have to be in a sense, losing our mind, even though there's physical problems that people do go through, and they're from the devil, and sometimes people just have to go through it no matter what, and God will restore them in the end. And there's medical breakthroughs all the time that help us be able to be improved in our physical life. 
But no matter what, if we follow God's word, we'll have more peace and a sound mind on what's truly right and wrong. And that's what's really an act of wisdom. We don't have to have a lot of knowledge to have some wisdom. And that's what God really wants to impart to us is a wisdom. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's go ahead and uh, think about the things on that list more than sometimes the things that Satan is doing. Sometimes it's so obvious what he's doing in the world today. And sometimes we really need to be aware of those things in order to counter them. But uh, one of the problems that a lot of people deal with today is guilt. And uh, so basically, guilt is right here in the old man. So that is not who we are. We're not really the old man. We have a new identity. So if you're dealing with guilt, then just realize that the old man is a guilty one. And he is guilty. And he produces fruit that is bad. But we are set free from that. And we are a new creation. The new nature makes us a new person and gives us a new identity, sets us free from guilt, and there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. So the best way to avoid guilt is to avoid that old nature because it is guilty in every phase. But anyway, the third nail is uh, participation in God's Word. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, reading His Word, meditating on His Word, and participating in the church. And let's go ahead and... Uh, Read uh, how important that is in Hebrews 10, 25. It says, uh, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I'm actually in the second edition, we'll add that in that, for that area, because that's really a good and important part of a third nail of fellowshipping with others. It's fellowshipping with God first, but then expand that to being plugged into a church and getting involved there. There's no perfect church. So the thing is that uh, what we need to do is make the church better because we've been there. And so that's the thing that we don't, uh, won't find a perfect church on this earth because we all have this old nature. The pastor has it. All the people there have it. We have it. We have to deal with it. But we can be empowered by the new nature to, um, to deny the old nature and let this light shine to to avoid the darkness that it produces. Let's go ahead and uh, look at Psalms 118.24. And this is a way that we should start each day and uh, with this prayer, in a sense, and declaration. The day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, so that's something that uh, I've been declaring for some time. And it's something that we need to put our faith in, that God has made that day for a purpose. He has a plan for us in that day. So uh, we can take joy in that plan, no matter what the devil's doing, and uh, no matter what's going on around us, that God has a plan for us, and it's found in his new nature coming through us, using us, communicating with us, inspiring us, directing us, teaching us. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at uh, how we connect to that new nature in 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world throughout through lust. That's Connecting to God's word through us, he's, he's always bringing his uh, word uh, to me, just uh, illuminating different things and giving me direction through the Bible. He actually did this morning, uh, added a verse towards the end here. And uh, so that's really what he wants us all to be able to be communicating with him through his pressure promises. We connect to the divine nature. And, uh, but we have a choice to do that. And in Romans uh, 6, 13... Uh, let's go ahead and read that uh, verse. Uh, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, 
but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Okay, so it's a matter of us yielding to the Holy Spirit our body and our members uh, do things that would be according to his word. It's our choice to do that. And uh, we can continue at 16 through 22 in that same chapter. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, wherefore ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Okay, so all the shameful fruit of the old nature will one day be put into a place that's dedicated for corruption. It's a lake of fire. It's heaven's graveyard. And so basically anything that we produce here is destined for the graveyard, for heaven's graveyard, the lake of fire. It's destined to be separated from all that's the activity in heaven. Anything we do here, in a sense, will last forever. There'll be things that basically we'll have rewards for and be able to enjoy the fruit of our labor with God or the fruit of the labor with the devil we'll see cast away from us. That identity will be separated from us and we'll be set free from it. It's actually enslaving the world today, but that'll be something that the world of heaven will be free from and not have any more influence from. Instead, it'll all have the fruit of the na uh, new nature God, love, joy, peace, and all the things that go along that direction. And uh, because of that separation, it's necessary for hell. And that's the reason why there is hell, fire. In order to have this, which is uh, inspired by Satan and will not cease, but has to be confined. Uh, to be able to have a place in heaven where it is confined and be a, a, a symbol for all those in the future why it's not good to rebel. It's not good to fall into these corrupt situations and how it contaminate our world. Let's go ahead and take a look at a verse I added this morning, Romans 8, 1, I'll uh, read that. And uh, it's the fact that we have no condemnation uh, because if we're in Christ, then all that condemnation is removed from us. It's no longer the person you are in heaven because you're a new person not even associated with the old man, the old person that once was. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, here, but after the Spirit. For the key is, walking after the Spirit, you don't have any condemnation in Christ. And in heaven, that's all there is. All this will be removed. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at... Um, how God, he loves us and wants to correct us from this. And that's because just like a child that's going astray, a good father would discipline that child because he doesn't want, he wants them to learn to do what's right. In Hebrews 12, 6 through 7, let's go ahead and read that. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourge every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Yes, and I, I want him to chase me early. I don't want to be falling into 
uh, deceptions or, or bad things for a long, lifelong uh, period of time. But God will correct us, and he'll continue to correct us. He's corrected me many times. He corrects me uh, regularly, actually. Um, and I appreciate that, actually, because I want to be made better by God and uh, not just fall into my own devices. Let's go ahead and read uh, Hebrews 12, 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afford it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Okay, so nobody wants to be disciplined. But if we're corrected through the discipline, then that's really the goal for us to be able to walk in truth and walk in the new nature and avoid the corruption that's found here. And so if we identify, if we dedicate our body and we purify our mind and we participate in God's word and activities that God's doing, then we'll find direction instead of correction. And that's really the, where the blessed life really is. Uh, correction is good for us if we need it, but direction is much better if we're willing to follow it. So let's go ahead and uh, look at uh, the key, and we'll close with these two uh, passages. The uh, less you feed the old man, the better you'll be. He can be on a cross yelling and screaming, but if you don't pay attention to him, you don't feed him, pretty soon you won't hear him much. And that's really what we're talking about, is really listening to the new man, feeding the new man, in a sense, fellowshipping with him. And how do we do that? It's in Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt mediate therein day and night. That's actually meditate. Med meditate therein day and night. And thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Okay, it talks about meditating God's Word. That's where you just don't read it, but you think about it. You roll it over in your mind. You do it day and night. Basically, your waking hours, you're kind of always kind of aware of God's Word and thinking about different things He's said to you. And in Psalms 1, 1 through 3 is a similar verse. And uh, let's go ahead and read that. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall doeth shall prosper. Okay, so that's really the key to real spiritual success. Now if I have a little chunk of time right here, and then I have an endless direction here, I can have a bad time right here. But uh, if it produces all this good in the long run, eternal good, then the bad time is almost insignificant as long as we connect to the new nature. Uh, dear Father, we do thank you for this day and thank you for your word and pray that you would help us to understand it and walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen.